Go. Go. Red light? Okay. <laughs> All right, so welcome to Healing by Design once again. We're on depression, so let me open in prayer. Be a good, all classes are good to open in prayer, but I think this is a really good one to open in prayer, right? All right, so Father, we, uh, we thank you for who you are. Uh, we exalt you for being the creator of all things, Lord, and uh, we ask for deeper understanding of your nature, of who we are, of who you designed us to be, and we ask for understanding related to how you designed the human body, body, soul, and spirit, uh, especially related to this topic of depression, Lord. We know it's your heart that we come into fullness of who you designed us to be and the great plans that you have for us, that you have for every single one of us, zero exception to that. So we want wisdom and understanding on how not to, uh, to have these issues like depression. So I, I, I just ask that you would speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So depression, pretty, pretty heavy topic. Um, I'm going to really hope that the Holy Spirit leads this one because um, uh, there's so many things you could say and you know it's just obviously you have to be tender um, and gentle and I guess the first thing I'd say is like who am I to have any authority to speak on depression and I will say that I don't really have any uh, just the wisdom that I feel like the Lord's given me and you know I have worked with a lot of people with depression um, I won't say that I've ever been what you might call clinically depressed, um, but I've definitely had my moments where life stinks and life's not worth living and what's the point. And, you know, I think it's fair to say, maybe not all of us, but the vast majority of us <laughs> have probably been there at some point in our lives. We've all had, you know, major lows in our lives. And, you know, I, I've struggled with those, those thoughts. Um, but I can't say that I've ever been you know, depressed to the point where every day is just a struggle to survive. I've never been there. And so I can't walk in people's shoes in that area. Um, but what I will say is I do believe firmly, and of course what I say is, is um, again, hopefully some wisdom in it uh, from God, um, but a lot of it, you know, it's just my opinion as well from, from things that I've learned. Um, but I do believe depression is, is related to a disconnect from God on every level. Um, body, soul, and spirit. But what I'm really going to highlight today, and I'm going to talk about those different areas, but the main thing I'm going to highlight today is the body, the human body, the physical body that God designed. Because I don't think a lot of people talk about our body and our health and nutrition related to depression, at least in Christian circles, which is you know, not all of my audience, but it's a big portion of my audience. So we're looking at past events that have happened in life and trauma and we need to be healed of those things and that's absolutely true. But what a lot of people don't recognize is that the, this physical body that God designed is designed to function a certain way. And we know that. We know that through our discoveries, right, of science. We know that there's serotonin that makes us happy and there's dopamine that gives us motivation and drive. And, DHEA is a hormone that's called the joy hormone that's produced in our adrenal glands and that gives us joy when that's being produced adequately. And you can go on down the list. This is God's design, like God's the designer. He's the chemist that made all these different things work in the body. So that's why I say depression is related to a disconnect from God. And it might be spiritually not knowing God or it might be emotional and struggling from lies that the enemy told us or traumas that have happened to us in our past that we haven't overcome, but also this physical component that we don't hear people talk about. And that's really, again, what I want to stress because we are body, soul, and spirit. And if we do heal our bodies, our physical bodies, we can come out of these uh, issues like depression because I've seen it. I've seen it. And I'll tell you a couple of stories uh, that hopefully will maybe give you some encouragement. Because again, I think a lot of times, especially in Christian circles, I mean, think about it. It's like, especially if you know God, like the real God, like the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you're still depressed. Like, that's really a hard one to kind of <laughs> to kind of cope with. It's like, hey, I know the truth. I know God. I know what the Bible says. Why do I struggle so much every day with these thoughts? And so... There's all kinds of great ministries out there, and there's deliverance ministries out there, and there's Encountering God sessions, and all those things are amazing. All those things help people and get breakthrough, and the Lord breaks in and, and helps people and heals people. 
But like I said, there's a physical component that is missing. And uh, I really want to highlight that. So, um, <clears throat> so I gave you all a handout that I actually did years ago on depression. And I just kind of updated it, maybe with a few little things. But it's really basically the same of, uh, of something I used to give people years ago. And I really kind of go into food and nutrition. And so I want to talk about that a little bit um, because I do think it's key. And like I said, I want to talk about some other things too. But I do want to focus mainly on nutrition. Because if you look throughout history and you look at how natural healers healed people, how did people heal people all throughout history? It's not really a trick question, but the answer I'm looking for is, yeah, somebody said herbs, things of God, because what else did we have, right? We had sunshine, we had the ocean, if you lived by the ocean, or different water sources. We had herbs, we had foods, we had these different things, and that's what people used. And if you read books from the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, I mean, trust me, depression is not anything new, right? So if you read these books, how did they treat people of these issues? They treated them with nutrition and fasting and um, being, going out into nature and embracing God and the things of God. That's why I say depression is a disconnect from God on some level, on some level. And now how are we treating it? How are we treating depression today? Drugs, man-made, chemical-based, pharmaceutical drugs. And again, I have to have some delicacy here because I know that there's people who would say that the, the drugs saved their life because they were so depressed that you know, this drug you know, helped them with that. But the way I look at things is I look at it from God's design perspective. And so if we're struggling with different thoughts and emotions, there's a reason for it because if we believe God designed us, there's a reason we're acting this way, or feeling this way, or thinking this way, right? There's a reason for it. It's not just random. And wh what's hard about it is we know that that's like, that's not who we really are. <laughs> like I'm not, these thoughts and things that I'm thinking and feeling isn't who I really am. And we know that, but sometimes it's hard to break out of that. But what I will stand behind is that I don't believe anybody who has any type of depression is deficient in a pharmaceutical drug. That's not the cause of depression, that you're deficient in Prozac or any one of these other uh, drugs that are out on the market. Unfortunately, what's happened, and this article talks about it, mental health, it's life, not depression. Now, some people might take offense to that because you're like, hey, you don't know where I've been. But it's a, it's a pretty real article about different people who have had depression and she talks about four different people, and then at the end of the article, she talks about what's happened to those four people. And uh, some of them committed suicide, but some of them <coughs> decided, hey, I don't need the drugs, it was just a rough patch in my life, and they're perfectly fine today. And so these are things we gotta navigate when we're struggling with these thoughts. Um, what she talks about is the unhealthy relationship between pharmaceutical drugs and depression. And we think about psychiatrists. Now, I still hear this today. I still hear this today. I have people that go to the doctor. They have issues going on. They know that there's problems with their body. They can give you a laundry list of symptoms. The doctor runs some tests, runs some blood work. Everything comes back. You're perfectly fine. Let me schedule an appointment for you to see a psychologist. It still happens today. I still hear people tell me that. So if their tests don't find anything wrong with you, then you have a mental problem. And so this is one way people get on drugs. Do you know the fastest growing market for um, antidepressants right now? Children. Antidepressants might help a few people, but they also kill people and they destroy people's lives. And she talks about it in this article, almost every one of those mass shootings or crazy things that seem to happen Almost in every single one of those cases, those kids were on antidepressants. Yep. If you, if you research Columbine and these different tragedies, they were all on pharmaceutical drugs. So they mess with the mind. 
Um, and so what, what I want to share with you is that God has better ways. God has better solutions. There's, an, again, an, a misalignment with how God designed us to function. And a pharmaceutical drug isn't fixing anything. It's actually covering up the problem. It's covering up whatever our issue really is. <clears throat> what happened in the industry was that there are people who have quote unquote, and I'm not even saying I know what that means, but clinical depression, like, you know, every day is a struggle, suicidal thoughts, those kind of things. But what happened is, is people who are just having things happen in life, having a rough week or broke up with their boyfriend or got sick or what, you know, whatever, they would go to the doctor and they'd put them on drugs and then they get hooked on the drugs. This is the kind of thing that's happening today. And the statistics from this article is in 2008, so I'm sure it's a lot worse now, but back then it was 4% of men and 10% of women on drugs. Now 4% uh, on antidepressants specifically. Now does 10% sound like a lot of people? In this group, maybe not. In 300 million people in America, 10% on antidepressants? That's a big deal. That's a big deal. So she wrote a book called, um, or this person who wrote this article wrote a book called Let Them Eat Prozac, The Unhealthy Relationship Between the Pharmaceutical Industry and Depression. And she went on to talk about how the antidepressants don't really work. Okay, what they're doing is they're blocking receptor sites in your body that uh, move serotonin through your body. So it's actually a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So it's actually blocking serotonin from moving through your body. And so that's how it works. So it doesn't teach your body to naturally produce uh, serotonin. And again, there are physical components to how God designed us that help us produce these different neurotransmitters so, uh, and so that they function in our body appropriately. And so you can read that article. I'm not going to go through that, through that article. But I really want to talk first about food and nutrition and the link. Think about how God designed the body. Now, if we know that part of how he designed us, and we know this again through, through science, that we have serotonin, and everybody's heard of that, and we have dopamine, and we have DHEA, and we have epinephrine, and norepinephrine, and progesterone, and all these different hormones that form these different, uh, that have these different functions in the body related to, you know, happiness, and joy, and energy, and motivation, and all these different moods that we feel. How do you think those neurotransmitters are produced? How do you think God designed the body to function? Well, he, he designed the body to function based on his design. And his design was us designed in his image. And his design was a Garden of Eden that he gave us. And he said, eat of these things. And what are we eating today? We're not eating of the Garden of Eden. We're eating of processed food, fast food, chemical-filled food, uh, white flour, white sugar, I mean, just, just junk. And it's not God's design. So how do we expect neurotransmitters and hormones to work when we're not putting things that God designed into the human body? And so nutrition's a huge link because if our brain need certain things to work properly, or adrenal glands need certain things to produce hormones properly, how do they get what it needs? Through what goes in our mouth. How else do we get it? I mean, there, there are some things we get through the sun, and water is a carrier of information, but it's mainly through the foods that we choose to eat. And so it's kind of this, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, it's kind of this vicious cycle or whatever that you know, we get sad, we get depressed, we eat food because it's like a comfort thing for us. We're eating the wrong foods, so it's making our body sicker. We're not producing neurotransmitters right, and we go further into depression, and then that's what gets us on the drugs. But what if the truth was is that food could get you out of depression? Because it can. And I'll just tell you a couple stories real quick, because uh, I'll never forget this one gal. She, and it had nothing to do with I did. It was something that she had done before I'd even met her. She came in and we were talking about all her list of symptoms and, and um, she had told me that in the past she had struggled with depression. For 20 years, she was on antidepressants. 20 years, 
on antidepressants. And if you know antidepressants, they're hard to get off of because they really mess with and manipulate your body. She learned about nutrition and she stopped eating grains. Grains. So we're talking bread, pasta, pizza, crackers, you know, a lot of people go gluten free, but she stopped eating grains, that category of food, grains. In three days, she was off her antidepressant and she's never had a problem since. Why? So 20 years, depressed, stopped eating grains, and now she has no issues. So how could that possibly be? And especially if we believe that like all of these things like depression is some kind of like just emotional stability or there's something wrong with me or I just don't think right. And I'm not saying there's not some components to um, our thoughts because that is obviously very important what we think. But food plays a big role because the foods we eat should be nourishing our body and healing our bodies and supplying nutrients to our nerves and our nervous system that has a huge role to play in our health and neurotransmitter function because that's how things are transported. Water, because that's how nutrients and neurotransmitters are, are uh, transported. So think about eating processed food. Think about drinking soda pop and coffee and all these things that aren't water. And our body can't produce what it needs and it can't transport what it needs for things to work properly. So we have to take pharmaceutical drugs to try to somehow you know, block serotonin so that it stays in our system is basically what we're doing with these types of drugs. If you look at medical literature in the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, they always treated people for depression with nutrition and fasting and sunshine. And you, so read any, like people ask like, what, what book should I read on, on like medicine or nutrition? Read any book pre-1900 and you'll get all kinds of great information on medicine. Read any book post-1900 and it's full of pharmaceutical drugs. They used to call it melancholy. If you've heard that term, yeah. melancholy, yeah. yeah. And melancholy, they always treated by working on the liver. So think of somebody who's an alcoholic, okay? Yes, there's some emotional component in disconnect from life or God or family or something, there's no doubt about it. But on top of that, they're putting in straight liquid sugar into their body. It's destroying their liver. And the physical component also leads to that vicious trap and that cycle of not getting out of it because we don't feel good in our bodies either. Has anybody not felt good in their body or had a rough day and decided to eat? I mean, my gosh, I've only done that a thousand times. Yeah. So, so we have to start looking at food as you know, something that God gave us to heal our bodies. And if we don't care about what we eat and we continue to eat junk food or eat processed food, it's just gonna continue this vicious cycle of, of depression. Have you heard of like probiotics, the good bacteria that's in our gut? Okay, they started for a while, they started calling probiotics the new Prozac because they noticed that if people had healthy gut flora and they took probiotics, suddenly they were happy. Well, why is that? 90 plus percent of serotonin is actually produced in the gut, not in the brain. So only 5% of your serotonin, 5, 10% of your serotonin is produced in your brain. The rest of it's produced in your gut. It matters what you eat. Why did the gal have depression for 20 years, stopped eating grains, and now she's not depressed anymore? Because if our body's compromised, our digestion's compromised, and things get out into the body that aren't designed to be in the body, like into the bloodstream or into the brain, the body starts to react and starts to shut down. So think of all the autoimmune diseases people are having. People are getting Alzheimer's and these different brain-related conditions. It's the degeneration of the body from poor nutrition, also the pharmaceutical drugs. But the body's going to deteriorate if we don't give it the right building blocks. I always say God's a great designer. He's like the perfect architect. It's just we've given him really junky building materials, for, especially for the last four or five generations. And so if you eat food and it doesn't get properly broken down and digested, it gets out into your bloodstream and starts to affect the ability of your body to function properly. And so you've heard of leaky gut maybe, so it's kind of like the leaky gut thing. Maybe you've heard the, term, or the phrase, they say it's not about what you, you know, they say you are what you eat, right? It's not about what you eat, it's about what you digest and assimilate and eliminate. 
So it's really about the, the, the body working the way God designed the body to work. And that's why we can overcome depression with food. Or we can get into the pit of you know what with food. Because food will also get us into that pit if we just continue to eat, 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 eat. Uh, especially, you know, processed foods. But even people eat healthy foods and they're like, oh, I eat healthy foods. Well, they're still overeating. They still have emotional reasons that they eat. Um, there's still obviously a disconnect in how they're eating. So we got to look at that component too. It's not just about you know, the quality of the food you eat. It's the reason why you're eating what you eat. And I don't know. I mean, I don't know why this food issue hasn't been addressed largely in, in, in the church. Again, as a, as, a, as a believer, like it's hard for me to understand why the, the food issue hasn't been addressed in the church. It's not like it's not in the Bible. I mean, the Bible I read says that as soon as you're full of food, you will forget the Lord your God. You know, the Bible talks about, um, I think it was Jesus, he said that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Well, what do we spend our lives doing? Eating and drinking. It's all about eating and drinking. And that's not the kingdom of God. Now, God designed us to need food, but it's supposed to be for life, for vitality, for nourishment, not for every indulgence and every pleasure and to stuff our emotions and all the other reasons that we eat. So we have to address it in a real way if we really want to get through especially difficult issues like depression. So I talked about avoiding the main things. And I'll just give you the main ones that if you can get them out of your diet can improve your mood. Let's just say that. If you can get these things out of your diet, it will improve your mood. And I don't know if I can give them a priority order because I think there's three big, big, big ones. Um, so I won't put any w more weight into one than the other, but I will start with sugar because that probably is like the monster in the living room, right? Or the elephant in the room or whatever they call it, right? I mean, who doesn't eat sugar when, they, they, when they're not happy? I mean, we eat sugar when we're happy and we eat sugar when we're not happy. <laughs> so sugar is definitely the, the big one and it will make you depressed. Why? Because there's, no, there's nothing life-giving to it. We simply do it for the pleasure of our own flesh. Uh, if, and so if we're not eating in a way that's life-giving, that's honoring to God, that's honoring to ourselves, that's honoring to how God designed us and, and the purposes he has on us on the, in this world, then we're just doing it for ourselves. And anytime you focus on yourself and not God, you're going to go the wrong direction. And a lot of depression, and, and again, I say this with tenderness, a lot of depression is because people are focused on themselves and they're not focused on other people, and they're not focused on God. And they're only doing what they want to do, and then they'll even get mad at you about it. Well, you don't know where I've been, and you don't know where I've come from, and it's just all about them. And so again, that, those are real things that need to be addressed. And if you want to be honest with yourself, you know, if you have, if you have these kinds of issues, you, you want to think about those things. So sugar's the big one, hands down. Um, the second one, I will say, is the grains. And a lot of people are going getting away from gluten and going gluten-free. And a lot of that's because of pain, because it's not working well in our digestion, our stomach hurts, we don't feel well. But it's also affecting our mind and our brains. And we get brain fog. You've heard of the brain fog thing and the concentration focus issues or whatever. You stop eating sugar, you stop eating grains, the most of that goes away. And, and again, why? We've overeaten it, for one. Um, a lot of it isn't your fault, but it is your responsibility. What I mean by that is our parents didn't eat well, our grandparents didn't eat well, grandma and grandpa lived into their 90s, but they started the whole mess. Well, actually it started way before them, but they were the ones eating donuts and drinking coffee and thinking, oh, this is great, all this new processed food. But that started the cascade of degeneration. And so we have to break out of it, even though we, you know, I joke like we've been dealt a bad hand, you know, generationally, because most of us have. Um, but, but because of that, we have to make wise choices. Because if we don't make wise choices, and our body's already compromised, and we don't eat well, we're going to have these issues. And again, we're talking specifically about depression, but you know, you're talking arthritis and digestive issues and all kinds of things people are suffering from today. So sugar, grains, and I'm not just talking about gluten. Gluten's a protein that gets undigested and wreaks havoc in the body. There's no doubt about it. But it's more the complex sugar molecules that are hard on the system, 
hard on the adrenals, hard on digestion, and they bog us down. What's one of the key components to depression usually? Fatigue. No motivation. You're just tired all the time. Well, when you eat heavy foods and complex sugars and grains and starches, it just makes you tired. And you just, you're sluggish. That certainly is not helping. And so they're complex sugar molecules that are hard to digest. Fruits, definitely a better choice. Always a better choice. It's really hard to get addicted to apples. But it's pretty easy to get addicted to cookies and brownies and cupcakes and ice cream and blah, 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 blah. And that's going to send you down that road. So you, you got to break out of it, I, you know. Uh, the third one I will say is dairy. And that's because our body's designed to be free-flowing and it's not, it's congested. And so if our liver's backed up and our lymphatic system's blocked up and we're eating dairy, we're furthering, we're furthering the congestion of our body. And if our body's congested, we're not gonna think right. We're not gonna produce neurotransmitters right. We're not gonna digest very well. And so just getting away from those three categories, which I say just, you're like, that's all I eat. What, what the heck am I supposed to eat? <laughs> But if you can get rid of dairy, grains, and sugar, you will be like on, your, on the road to better health in general, but uh, related to this depression issue. I guarantee it, because I've seen it. I've seen it so many times with people. You know, and what's interesting about it is people suffer from depression two years, five years, 10 years, whatever, and all of a sudden they not, they're, they're not struggling with those things, and they almost didn't even realize it. I mean, they just come in and like, everything's good. They're like, you almost forget that you are struggling because you, you feel good and you don't need the medication anymore or whatever. You do have to be cautious with those medications. Those are one of the hardest drugs to get off of as antidepressants, especially like Lexapro. So you need to do the right things and you need to slowly wean off of it. And there's ways to do that. The other big one I would implicate is all the, the fatty fried junk. So fried foods, hydrogenated fats and oils that's in all the packaged foods, uh, the vegetable cooking oils. Again, we're gumming up the system, okay? The, the body can't work the way God designed it if it's all gummed up, blocked up, congested. So as soon as you get rid of those foods and eat lots of fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and lean meats, chicken, turkey, fish, that kind of stuff, fine, um, you're, you're, you're going to start to feel better. Again, I can... I can, I can guarantee it. Might not get you all the way there. I'm sure there's other things that are part of your, your history or your past uh, related to your emotions or traumas that people experience. It's almost like what happens is, I don't know, I don't know how to, if I'm gonna say this right. So it's almost like something, yeah, I don't know how to say it. Because everybody's different, everybody's so unique. I feel like some people can just get into food and, 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 and just damage their body and then just get stuck in that pattern. But I think a lot of times something bad happens in our past, which most all of us have had bad things happen to us in our past. We get traumatized. And we have that trauma and that emotional struggle we're trying to overcome. And on top of it, all of a sudden now food becomes an issue because that kind of becomes our emotional crutch. And it's like, boom, like the devil has us. Because like we believe lies, related to the trauma that we haven't healed from. And then on top of it, we're like, we're stuffing it in with food and we never get healing. We never get breakthrough and we get deeper and deeper and deeper into the pit. And so I think part of reversing that process is maybe actually starting with nutrition. What a great place to start. If you can actually feel better and have more energy and think more clearly, you know, you still might have to deal with the emotional stuff from your past, which I know a lot of us don't want to maybe deal with, but I think nutrition can jumpstart that. And I've actually seen that with what we're doing right now with the cleansing. I mean, we've got people doing kidney cleanses and all kinds of emotional stuff is just surfacing in people. Um, and I've heard all kinds of things about people, all these emotions are coming up and thoughts of things from their past and regretting things that happened from the past. All these emotions are surfacing. And so what does that mean? It means they're in us. And God wants to heal us and he wants to bring them out and he wants us to cry and he wants us to know that he was there and he cares and he wants us to give him all his troubles and all those biblical scriptures we can talk about. He really wants all those things. 
but we have so much of that stuff inside of us. And so I really think nutrition is a big part of actually starting the healing process. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few specific things. Vitamin C, one of the main things used to, to treat depression now. The highest sources of vitamin C, oh, and I have some examples of some fun stuff here, but this is camu camu berries, acerola cherries, amla berries. It's all the highest known sources of vitamin C. It's great for our immune system, but it's really good for the adrenal glands. It's actually, um, the adrenals produce more, uh, use more vitamin C than any other part of the body. And um, vitamin C helps heal the adrenals. And so the adrenals is where all of our steroid hormones come from progesterone, testosterone, estrogen, DHEA, cortisol. All those hormones are produced in the adrenals. So boosting your adrenals is really helpful for people with depression. It's one of the first things I work on when I have, see somebody with depression is food first. You know, eat fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, get away from all the processed food. Just that, people start feeling better. Oh my gosh, life's not so bad. And then you start working on their adrenals because that's where the majority of hormones are produced in the body. And all of a sudden, life gets a lot better. Uh, number two I talk about is an herb called Mucuna purians. It's a really funny name, but it's really high in, in uh, something called L-DOPA. And L-DOPA is a precursor to dopamine. So different people struggle with different things. But for one, uh, sometimes people struggle with motivation and drive. And I just want to get out of bed. I just can't get out of bed. And so, mucuna in small doses can really increase dopamine, which gives you drive and motivation. Another hormone that comes from the adrenal glands. It's amazing how important those little tiny walnut-sized adrenal glands are that sit on top of our kidneys. Pine pollen, which isn't on your sheet, is the highest known plant-based source of DHEA. You can start taking pine pollen in powder, throwing it in smoothies, throwing it in salads, just make it part of your food. Yes, it's the yellow pine pollen that you see when you go walk through the woods. It contains hormones. Why? It's the reproductive part of the tree. God's a cool designer. God designed us to discover, God designed us in creation to discover him and discover pine pollen. Not to discover McDonald's hamburgers and Twizzlers and soda pop. For real. We wouldn't be in this pickle we are. I know we'd still have our issues. But we certainly wouldn't be where we're at today if we could just embrace the things that God gave us. And so we can learn about pine pollen and you know, some of these other things that can help with our, with our hormones. St. John's wort, a lot of people know about that. Uh, they do say not to do St. John's wort with antidepressants, but it really does. This is like a plant God gave us that really increases serotonin. And we actually have a product called Happy Juice, and it really works. And people love it, and it makes them happy. So. Um, that has St. John's wort in it, but it also has a couple calming and relaxing herbs in it, like chamomile and what is in there, feverfew, and wild lettuce is the other one. So that's a pretty good formula. Uh, ginkgo biloba just increases circulation in the body and to the brain. So we're talking about neurotransmitter function. We're talking about transporting nutrition, transporting neurotransmitters to the brain and the different parts of the body. So ginkgo biloba is going to help with that kind of circulation. Holy basil has always been my favorite plant for years. I actually have one now that um, I'm more excited about than holy basil, if you can possibly imagine that. But holy basil, I've been using for years for people with stress and anxiety. And talk about a symptom of depression, stress and anxiety, very common. You know, people go through major you know, death in the family or a loss of a, a dog can send people into depression or uh, a divorce, or you know, there's just all kinds of tough things that happen in life. But like she said in the article, sometimes it's life and it's not depression, which means not like, hey, just buck up, soldier, but it's like, let's not go to the antidepressant, let's not go to the drug, let's you know, embrace and work through this and talk through it and find loved ones to support us and eat well um, and different things. So. So holy basil calms and relaxes the body. It uplifts the mood and the spirit at the same time. We have sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bottles of holy basil. We absolutely love it. And so that probably won't change. It actually stops the excessive production of cortisol from the adrenal glands. 
So that's very beneficial to stop cortisol, which is what's pumping out when we're stressed out. Now, a plant that I think is even better than that, imagine that, is CBD, cannabidiols, which is just one nutrient that's in the hemp plant, H-E-M-P, hemp, okay, not marijuana, hemp. It's a sister plant. It has hardly any THC, so it's not going to make you high or whatever. But CBD is the most powerful thing I've ever seen for stress, anxiety, pain, inflammation, seizures. It's worked literally the day people start taking that, that have seizures, they can get off their medications. It's unbelievable. Um, they are, uh, there's all kinds of information out there about CBD and how it helps people with depression. So think about why people smoke, why people drink, why people eat. What are we really doing? There's all kinds of answers you could give. Self-medicating would be a good way to look at it. We're, we're stuffing, you know, we're not dealing with life, we're stuffing back our emotions. But what are we mainly sedating when we're choosing those foods? We're sedating our nervous system. We're sedating our nerves so that we don't have to deal with life. How do we deal with life? What does sensory perception work through? Our nervous system. Things we touch, things we feel. We don't want to feel, we don't want to touch. We want to sedate. And so some people go from one crutch to the next. They stop smoking, but they stop eating. They stop drinking, but they start eating. And food's the one that like everybody's just okay with because gosh, what else do you have left to self-medicate yourself with? You know? <laughs> I mean, we've run out of options. So I, I'm saying all this because ultimately the answer is always God. God doesn't want us to sedate ourselves. He doesn't want us to smoke or drink or you know, destroy our bodies. We're made in his image. He doesn't want us to damage these bodies that he destroyed. He doesn't want us to eat, overeat, eat the wrong things, even overeat healthy things. It's not what God designed us for. It's not the purpose God designed you for. And so the CBD oil naturally calms and relaxes the nervous system. And people can take CBD oil and stop smoking and stop drinking and get off of drugs because it relaxes the nervous system. And that's powerful. That's powerful because all these drugs, although they might quote unquote work for people, there are major, major long-term consequences to taking a petrochemical because they are not of God's design. And I've made that very clear in all my classes in the past that all things in the medical system, all, all drugs work against God's design. So when we're taking pharmaceutical drugs, we're taking things that work against how God designed the body to function. Now, I'm not saying you're not really depressed, but I'm saying God has a different answer and he wants to show you why, you're why you are struggling with these things and how you can realign with his heart to come back into alignment with the living God, not medicating it with a man-made drug. So that's really important. Cashews. Cashew is one of the highest known food sources of tryptophan. Okay, tryptophan, L-tryptophan, is important for mood and for sleep. And so cashews have a high amount of that. Uh, chamomile, that's why a lot of people drink chamomile tea, is also really high in L-tryptophan. Chocolate has, I don't know who came up with this, over 300 known mood-boosting nutrients. I mean, come on. I mean, we like chocolate. I think the problem is, is it's usually full of too much sugar. Very few of us probably eat the raw cacao, um, but there are a lot of things in there that, that can uplift and elevate mood. And so for what that's worth, fermented food. So this is kind of talking about the probiotics, the living bacteria. I kind of talked about that a little bit about probiotics being the new Prozac. And it's because they produce serotonin in the gut. And they also break down and digest our food properly so that we don't have these undigested food molecules getting out into our body, leaking out into our bloodstream, causing depression, causing autoimmune diseases, causing arthritis, inflammation, pain, all of these things from poor digestion. So fermented foods can really help with that. So like sauerkraut or kimchi or taking a good probiotic. B vitamins, why B vitamins? Nervous system again. So many great things you can do for your nervous system. 
B vitamins are one of the best things you can do for your nervous system. So you can take B vitamins, you can sprinkle nutritional yeast on your salads, you can do royal jelly or bee pollen or any of the bee products are high in B vitamins. Anything that supports your nervous system is going to help you naturally deal with life better. Let's just say it that way. And what part of your body controls your nervous system? Your adrenal glands. What are we amped up on? Caffeine, coffee, soda pop, sugar, all those different things that mess up the adrenals, mess up our nerves and nervous systems. Again, that's what sends us down the wrong road. So we really need to support our nerves and our nervous system. And we do that how? Calm, relaxation, listening to nice music, going out in nature and connecting with nature. How do we destroy our nervous systems? Food, coffee. The biggest way you can destroy your nervous system is TV. We talk about completely numbing yourself. That's what television does. And so it's just a way to, to, to hide from the world that so many people do. So there's so many other things. Again, this is why people smoke. This is why people do so many of these numbing things is to, to hide from, from, from reality. I'm not saying TV's bad or whatever. You know, I'm, Our girls watch Bible shows on TV once in a while, but I'm saying if it's like, if it's become your God, so to speak, but if it becomes your crutch, you know, like food or whatever, again, you just, you, you, you got to break free from sedating yourself from the world. I mean, God didn't design us to hide. Did God design us to hide from the world? Yeah, we've all gone through difficult times, but God didn't design us to hide from the world. And so we need to embrace how God designed us, which is embracing our sensory perception and getting back out into the, to the world and dealing with some of these things. So. so number 11, I put raw living foods. Consider fasting. Oh my gosh, I could tell you some stories. Um, Lord, probably more than anything in the last couple of years for me that's highlighted what can help heal the most people. And people who track with what we're doing at Spirit of Health will probably see this accelerate, but it's fasting. Okay, there's a reason we're called to fast. There's a reason Jesus said, when you fast, not if you fast. When the disciples were walking with Christ, they didn't need to fast. But now every single person on this planet needs to fast. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One is we need revelation from God. We need revelation from the Holy Spirit. But the other reason we need to fast is we need to turn away from the things of the world. We need to turn away from food, you know, for example, that's destroying us or or technology, you know, some people fast TV or, you know, different things or whatever, but anything that's um, engrossing your life in a negative way that's not of God, you know, we need to turn away from those things, and that's why fasting is so important. Um, there's a story, I think it's in the GAPS Diet book, but of a gal who was, uh, it was like a home, home rest kind of thing, but she would take in people who had mental disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar, these different types of issues. And she was in her house, and the gal with the schizophrenia got out. And they called the authorities, and they did a search for the city, and they couldn't find this lady. And she was missing for a week. And a week later, the lady showed up at the house, knocked on the door, and said, hey, uh, I think you guys were looking for me. But she wasn't schizophrenic. She acted perfectly normal. After one week, how did that happen? She wasn't, on, she wasn't taking any of her drugs, and she didn't eat any food because she was lost, and she healed fasting. So the way God designed the body is to heal itself, and it heals itself when we stop eating food. We kill ourselves when we keep eating food. I mean... This might sound like a bold statement, but I'm just going to say it. I think the biggest reason most people get disease and die prematurely is because they eat food. Wrong way. The wrong way. The wrong foods, eating food the wrong way. I mean, well, how else do we explain all the sickness and disease and degeneration in our culture if it's not for food? And so, yeah, it's really sad. Uh, but fasting is powerful. So just stopping eating grains and sugar, that's a form of fasting, and you're going to feel better. And it's not because grains are like the worst thing ever. It's because we've fallen so far 
and our food supply is so destroyed and our bodies are so weak because of what we've done generationally that people just can't handle even healthy grains anymore. I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of people. And so, um, what was I talking about related to food? Fasting. Fasting. Thank you. So one of the fastest ways, <laughs> fastest ways to heal the body is through fasting. It really is. Again, that there, I, I have a book in there by Dr. <laughs> Herbert Shelton, who personally supervised 30,000 people fasting. He was a doctor. He said, I've seen every single ailment known to mankind reversed through fasting. The only people he said he saw did not heal were people who had cirrhosis of the liver where their liver was so hardened it couldn't regenerate itself. But name any other disease condition and he saw it healed through fasting. Now is this not the beauty of God and the beauty of God, the simplicity of, I always say, let go and let God. We don't let go and let God. We hold on to food, TV, entertainment, everything that numbs us and destroys us. We want to hold on to it all. It, what are we really doing? We're holding on to the world. We're holding on to worldly things that bring destruction to God's creation. Food thing is hard because we have to eat, right? Like, we kind of have to eat something at some point. So it's a challenge, but we have to talk to God about it, and we have to walk in moderation, and we have to eat healthy things, and you know, we have to realize what's happening. So fasting is extremely powerful. I just really wanted to highlight the power of fasting. Animals in nature, when they're sick, they fast. When you get really sick, you fast. You lose your appetite. Why? Because the body's healing. And the body heals itself. Every gland, let me, let me just say this, like, we're the camera. It doesn't matter what sickness or disease you have. It doesn't matter what emotional instability issue you have. It can be healed through fasting. You want to know a good biblical example of that? How amazing were the apostles? I mean, the, somebody touched Paul's handkerchief and they were healed. Somebody walked in Peter's shadow and he was healed. Okay, this is still available to us today if we could let go of the things of the world and choose God. This kind of power is available through Christ. But there was a, a, a boy that was having epileptic seizures that the, the apostles couldn't, couldn't heal, right? You know that story? And so what did Jesus say? This one only comes out through prayer and fasting. So I am a firm believer that the future of those who grow in Christ, who grow in godliness, are going to turn more and more away from these worldly systems and turn more and more towards God. There's really no way to do that besides fasting. We have to let go of the world. But what's cool about it is you'll encounter God and your body will physically heal. Because as soon as you stop putting food in your body, your body goes, gets to work and it just starts cleaning out waste. And I could tell you stories for hours, but maybe that's for another time. But I just wanna, really wanna stress fasting is the fastest way to heal of anything. Because what you're doing is you're letting go of the things of the world and you're, you're letting God do the work. Or I should say you're partnering with God for you guys to do it together, because that's what it's all about. Love your liver, that was number 13. That's mainly what they treated for people with melancholy back in the 1800s, 1900s. They focused on liver health because think of the emotions tied to the liver. Like we've heard of that. It's in Chinese medicine, other, other cultures, religions, New Age. They talk about it. We don't talk about it a lot in Christianity or the body of Christ. We should because it's a real thing. But from the liver, we have unforgiveness, resentment, anger, bitterness, so if people are dealing with liver issues, they're usually dealing with these issues. Now, how do you want to look at it? Do you want to say, well, I haven't forgiven this person and I'm angry and I'm bitter. You can change your patterns. You can forgive who you need to forgive. You could not walk in those negative emotions anymore. That'll start you on the path for healing. Physically, though, you can also decongest your liver. You can unblock your liver. Now, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen when you start cleansing your liver. You're going to start to get bitter, angry, <laughs> resenting people. I'm not kidding. These emotions are going to come up because they're stored in your body. I'm just telling you the truth. 
This is why people who are doing the kidney cleanse right now are struggling with grief, sorrow, anxiety, and, and it's, it's, it's tough. But there's, there's emotions trapped in our body because of our choices, because of our past, because of past sin, because of past traumas. It's a real thing, and we need to start talking about it more. So, um, I had a gal, I just want to share this story, another major, major, major depression issue. Years, 10 plus years. Hormonal imbalance is a big deal, right? We haven't even really talked about that. We've kind of talked a little bit about the neurotransmitters and hormones and the, the adrenal glands. But if your liver's not working, your liver's what filters hormones. Your liver filters hormones. Why does the liver filter hormones? What does the liver filter? You guys know this. The liver filters blood. All blood in your body is filtered through your liver. How is everything transported through your body? Blood. So when you have a hormonal cycle, and you have all those symptoms and the mood swings and the cramping and all this horrible stuff, your liver's blocked up. Because menopause symptoms, it's, it's liver problems. And, and I've told the story about my wife and the first and second pregnancies, how they were totally different because we worked on her liver in between pregnancies. And the second pregnancy, she had zero symptoms of pregnancy. She had no morning sickness, no nausea, felt so great. She was like, am I still pregnant? I'm like, yeah, you're still pregnant, honey, it's okay. <laughs> so liver is a big deal and it's because liver filters blood and if you have hormones that are used up that you don't need anymore that can't get filtered out through the liver you have symptoms so this is why women have symptoms around their cycle liver is a big big deal so estrogen progesterone these are really important hormones related to a woman's cycle uh, had a gal one time who was struggling with depression for over 10 years learned about progesterone and progesterone deficiencies, got tested, found out she was uh, deficient in progesterone, started taking progesterone, boom, wasn't depressed anymore, overnight. But the reason, uh, the bi a big portion of why this was occurring because of her liver. So maybe she wasn't producing enough progesterone, maybe her liver, was, liver wasn't filtering out and balancing it properly, because if you don't have enough progesterone or you don't filter it out properly, you become estrogen dominant. And that can cause all kinds of issues, even like cancer issues, but it can cause depression issues too. That's why all these pharmaceutical drugs, I mean, how many pharmaceutical drugs cause depression? Like it's right on the label. All kinds of pharmaceutical drugs cause depression. Even the antidepressants say on it that it may cause depression and schizophrenic behavior and all this horrible stuff. Suicidal thoughts, exactly. So, so the last little portion I was gonna get into a little bit is depression equals disconnect. So it's about realigning with God and our creator. Nutrition does play a huge role. That's the body portion that most of us, a lot of people forget or they don't put enough weight into. So I wanna put a lot of weight into that because I think it is important. Um, so, Discovering God is super crucially important. And it might sound obvious, but I think sometimes we're in it, and I've been in these places where I'm just like, life sucks, and what's the point, and why am I doing what I'm doing, and does it mean anything? Like we don't even, we don't even think rationally, I think, sometimes when we're upset or we're depressed. And so what happens is, is depression for a lot of people becomes their identity, and it all becomes about the medication and managing their depression, and again, we're, 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 not, we're not being life-giving and we're not focusing on God and other things that, that, that should be our real focus. And so we're looking for a solution. I put in here, we're looking for the right pill. We're looking for the right person. I mean, how many people are like, oh my gosh, if I just married the right guy or married the right girl or what, right? I mean, you're laughing. So like we've been through this stuff, like uh, life would be perfect. So or the right stuff, or the right vacation, or the right house, or the, you, know what, you know what I'm saying, that's, that's pretty obvious, but, um, but we need to look up, and what I put is we need to look up because the world will disappoint us. At every level, the world and people will disappoint us. The people we love the most will disappoint us. Why? Because we're all sinful, and we're all broken. And if we didn't have an example like Jesus, like we'd be toast, because people will disappoint us. That's just that's the reality of life. 
And people can be great for us, and they can be uplifting and life-saving and life-giving. Um, but you can't put all your focus on people. You have to put it on God. And it's all God anyway. If, if somebody impacts your life in a positive way, it's because God used that person and God worked through that person to, to, to make a positive impact in your life, right? I mean, that's how it works. So uh, purpose is crucial for finding joy in life. So I think purpose is one of the most important things in life and especially related to depression. I mean, do we believe like Jeremiah, what is it, 2911, I know the purposes that I have for you. I mean, these scriptures, like God really has a purpose for every single human being on this planet. And we are so wrapped up in everything else but our own purpose. And a lot of times it's because we're seeking things, we're seeking happiness, but a lot of times it's just because we're seeking self and maybe we don't realize it. We're not seeking purpose in life because we're only focused on entertaining ourselves. And that's, that's pride, that's selfishness. That is a root of depression. And again, I, I, I say that with love because people can get mad at me and say, you've never been where I've been. And I, I know you're right, I haven't. But I do know that a root, a lot of a depression is self-focus. So I just wanna be clear about it because um, we need to find purpose in life outside of ourselves. Doesn't matter what happened to us in the past. Doesn't matter how traumatic our past was. We have to find you know, purpose in life. That is huge. Um, another story, I had a guy in my office, I think this is a good example. I had a guy in my office who was struggling with depression just recently. And what had happened is he retired from his job. Now, I didn't say this to him, but what I'm thinking is, where was your purpose in life? His purpose in life was probably wrapped up in his job. And so now he's depressed. But if his purpose in life maybe would have been more on God, and I'm not picking on this guy, but I'm saying if his purpose on life would have just been on serving God, then you retire and you're like, boom, God, what's next? Let's, let's rock. But it wasn't. He's now depressed after retiring. So it just shows how much we can get caught up in a job or a person, right? I mean, how many... How many teenagers do you think got on antidepressants because they broke up with a boyfriend or girlfriend? For real. That's no joke. That is real. Because they put all of their weight in a person. You can't put your weight in a person or a pet or a plant. I mean, <laughs> these things can bring us joy in life, right? I mean, these can be good things. But if you put all your weight on an, on an item or a person, you know, eventually it's got to be about God or it's, or it's a waste. Your life's a waste if it's not about God. It's just the truth. So, oh, I had that scripture here, Jeremiah 29, 11. I didn't even realize it. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Do we believe that? Especially if we're in a dark place. I mean, I've, I'll be honest. I won't tell you too much, but I mean, it's been within the last month that I don't know if I believe that. I mean, we all struggle. We can love the Lord with all of our hearts and really struggle with who we are and struggle with identity and struggle with purpose. And so we just have to keep our eyes on Him. Because really what's blocking us from our purpose and our destiny is worldly systems and, our, and self, right? Self. We, we block ourselves from our purpose and our destiny. Because God, you know, just like I talk about healing, like God's never in the way of your healing. He's never in the way of your healing. He's not in the way of your purpose and destiny either. He's not. It's just that we're choosing self or we're choosing other things in the world. So we got to let go. So I put disconnect from God can cause some of the following things. No hope in God, no purpose in life, not a real relationship with God. He wants relationship. He's looking for friends. It's a marriage. It's about a, a, an upcoming marriage. So we can have rebellion, disobedience, turn away from God, not thinking we're good enough for God. Like that's one of the biggest lies um, is that thinking we got to do something or clean ourselves up to like present ourselves to God. I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. That's actually pride if we think we have to do that. Because what we need to do is we need to have humility and say and fall you know, on our knees and say, God, clean me up because I can't do it myself. If we think we can clean ourselves up or we don't think we can present ourselves to God without getting cleaned up first, 
That's, that's just pride. So we, we need to give it over to God. Uh, being unthankful instead of thankful. That's a big one, I think. I mean, I really think one of the, re I struggle with this, like I struggle with uh, the abundance that we have. I really do. I struggle with how much our food budget is and we have this huge yard and we don't grow all our own food. I think about these things. Like we have such abundance that are we thankful anymore? Are we thankful that we have a roof over our head and clothes and food to eat? Because if we were thankful for those basic things, which the Bible says that's all we need, and God already knows what we need and he's taking care of it before we even thought about it, we're pursuing so many other things and we're, th we're, we're not thankful anymore. We're thankless. And again, that, those are, uh, these are things that can lead to depression. I mean, how many of us think that we just don't have enough? Or, again, if I only had this or only had that or if this was better, if I had more of this. So being thankful, I think, is, is really huge. Uh, unforgiveness, carrying our burdens instead of giving them to the Lord. So I talk about different ways to connect, connecting with people. And I put a little quote on here. The enemy wants to seclude us and destroy us. The enemy wants to seclude us and destroy us. People who are depressed want to go hide in a corner. And that is, that is a tool of the enemy. And people... People, unfortunately and sadly, have ended their lives. You know, I, I know people personally who have committed suicide. And that's a lonely place to get to that level to commit suicide. When God is all about people, and he's all about community, and he's all about fellowship, and he's all about us being together and encouraging each other and lifting each other up. So as hard as it is, if we're depressed, we have to reach out. If you hide in your cave thinking you're going to snap out of it yourself or just be strong enough to overcome it, you're, you're not. You're not strong enough. So we, we have to connect with, with people. That's really important. We've got to get out. Connecting with nature. I love connecting with nature. I mean, that's where I connect with God the most. I like to paint that picture of people, and I won't go into the, do the whole story. We could all, like, meditate on it. But, like, you can be super stressed, anxious, upset, depressed, you can go out in nature and a little deer comes up to you or something like, you're going to be like, whoa, that's cool, look at the deer. Like, you just like forget that you're like upset all of a sudden, you know? Like the little bird comes down and like, that's a cool bird. So nature is powerful. There is such power in nature and our bare feet on the earth and the sun in our face and going outside and camping. I mean, again, think of all these things that are of God and think about what we do when we're depressed. We stay inside, we watch TV, we eat, we stay alone and we're lonely. We don't reach out to other people, right? And, and, and God's kingdom is the opposite. It's the total opposite of all those things. So again, what are we choosing? Are we choosing ourself or are we, and are we choosing to hide? Or are we going to actually give it a go? So um, connecting with food. I put don't let food be your crutch, your lifeline, your comfort, and your enemy. <laughs> Food is meant to nourish and sustain the body, not torment us. And I won't give my testimony yet, because I'm not, it, not where I need to be yet for that. But uh, I have tortured, I have been tortured, and I've tortured myself with food for years and years and years. And I know there's deep, deeper roots because of it. I know there's generational roots to my food problems. And so these are just things we have to overcome. And uh, it's tough. It's a battle. It's really a battle. Connecting with exercise. God designed the body to move. Everybody feels better when they're exercised, but again, it's the old double whammy again. When you're depressed, who wants to go outside and exercise? You don't even want to get up and go take a walk. You just want to be sad, right? But when you exercise, you feel good. You feel better. And why? You're releasing hormones. That guy that I mentioned that was depressed after he quit his job said the only thing that made him feel better is when he went and exercised. Right? So at least he was getting out there and exercising. What's that do? Endorphins, epinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline. You're, you're producing hormones that generate life, that are life-giving. So exercise can be very powerful for helping people overcome depression. Imagine putting it all together. Like, God, I'm going to seek you for my purpose. I don't know what my purpose is. I'm lost. I'm clueless, but I'm yours. Like, that's a good first step. Changing your you know, white sugar, white flour, kind of getting some of the junk food out of your diet, maybe doing some herbs that help. I didn't even show you this other stuff, but there's all kinds of cool stuff. 
that help. Exercising, I mean, I always say, like, it's impossible not to get better if we choose God and if we choose life and the things of God. And just we're struggling so much. Connect with doing life. Uh, connect with your creative side. This is a cool thing I get to see in people's eyes. I, there's a thing I can see in people's eyes that I can tell they're super creative people. They're artists or they're dancers. And sometimes they're not, um, I was going to say, art, artist, artisting. What's the word? They're not dancing. They're not producing art. They're not being who God designed them to be. <coughs> identity, I didn't talk about identity. I talked about purpose, but identity is huge. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are and why you're on this earth? If you don't know who you are and why you're on this earth, then just, again, just get before God and ask him because you're just going to struggle your whole life. And so identity is huge. And some people's identity is in who God designed them to be. And maybe that's a dancer. And maybe for 20 years that person hasn't danced. Why? Maybe they had a bad experience dancing. Maybe, uh, maybe they gained weight. And they, don't, they, don't, they can't dance physically, or they gain weight and they don't look good when they dance, and they're worried what everybody thinks about them, or whatever. God designed you to dance. You need to dance. God designed you to do art. You've got to do art. So I talked to my wife about this because she's a super creative person, and she dances, but she's been a, uh, she loves art, and she doesn't do much art anymore. But like, that's, that's life-giving for her to express art and design and create so my point is, is we have to be who God designed us to be. Well, first of all, do you know who you are? Do you know who God designed you to be? Do you know your purpose on this earth? Are you just floating through life without purpose? And then we need to embrace who God designed us to be and embrace our gifts, talents, and abilities and do things for the kingdom of God because he has a purpose for every single person, every single person here and every single person watching this. You have a purpose in God. And if you haven't found that yet, I really encourage you to seek that out. So I will end there. I know I'm over an hour. So hopefully that gives some people some ideas on depression. But like I said, don't underestimate the power of food because that can either get you deeper into depression and feeling bad about yourself or it can pull you out of it. It's a big piece of the puzzle. And I, again, I get to see it every day, praise God. So what questions might you have? Yes. If you're going to do a fast and you're on all of these different things, yes. you know, day by day, can you continue to take those and fast? So the question was, can you continue to fast while taking supplements? The answer would be, it depends on the fast that you're doing. If you're just eating fruits and vegetables, take all this stuff, that's fine. Even if you're doing a juice fast, you can take supplements. If you get into more serious fasting, like water fasting or dry fasting, probably not. Uh, but most people, fasting, especially if you've never done it before, you're just going to probably be doing like cutting out grains or sugar or dairy or whatever, uh, maybe just doing fruits. An easy way to fast, I tell people, just eat fruits and vegetables. Just eat lots of fruits and vegetables, cut out all the other stuff. That's a great way to fast. All raw? Uh, raw is ideal. You could cook it if you need to. It uh, wouldn't be the end of the world if you cooked it, but, but raw is ideal. So, but yes, you can take supplements while, and, and supplements while fasting are really powerful, especially if you're cleansing. Because if you're doing fruits and vegetables and taking herbs to clean your kidneys or whatever, that's, that like accelerates the healing process. That's kind of what we're doing now with all the cleanses that we're doing. So, yes? When you say fruits and vegetables, are, are root vegetables, like potatoes and sweet potatoes and things like that still good? Yeah, so she asked about, with vegetables, about root vegetables. In the cleanses we're doing right now for the summer, I'm not encouraging potatoes. Uh, I really said all vegetables are okay except potatoes. That was just the only exception. So even squash and stuff is okay. But just potatoes because they are so starchy. They're, they're not cleansing for sure. Yeah, and then on the fruit side, not, not overdoing too much fruit because it is sugary. Um, and fruit juices and not doing like dried fruit like dates and dried fruit. But really sticking to high water content fruits like citrus and grapes and berries and stuff like that. Yes? Um, how can someone else see, view this session? Do you, you, oh, the videos? Yeah. yeah, they're all video recorded. Okay. And on my website, there's two ways. On my website, under educational videos, there's a series called Healing by Design. Okay. 
and it's a to z. So I've been, I started at a, and we're just now at d. And those are all on there. Okay. And then on YouTube, I have a YouTube channel. Okay. So Spirit of Health KC on YouTube, and there's like 500 videos on there, so don't get overwhelmed. But um, all the most current ones are at the top. Okay. So, any other questions? Yes. Yes. You, you don't like dairy in the cleanses and all that, but as something that you want to cut out of your diet, you said sugar, grain, processed foods. Do you cut dairy out as well? Yes. And why? Okay, so good. I'm glad you asked that question. It's just an important one to understand. Um, the main, let's see, how do I explain it? I'll explain it two ways. One way, and you can argue this and that's fine, people do. Um, the main reason is because God designed cows for cow, cow's milk for cows and goat's milk for goats. You know, we don't drink other animals' milk. Uh, I'm not saying it hasn't been a food throughout history because it has. But God designed cow's milk for a cow and it takes a 50 pound calf and turns it into a 1,000 pound cow in one year. So no infant, no human infant should ever consume cow's milk for that purpose because it's not designed for a human. Um, <clears throat> the issue we're at today is our bodies are so congested and blocked and our livers are blocked, our lymphatic system's backed up. Um, we can't process dairy because it's a heavy food, because it's heavier than breast milk. And no other animal in nature continues to drink milk after infancy, after weaning. We just can't process it. And so anything that goes into the body that can't get processed is going to gum up the body. And so if you've ever known anybody who had allergies or asthma or eczema or any of these different conditions, they feel worse when they do dairy. Their sinuses flare up, their lungs get congested. Um, I've, I've seen children with horrible eczema and allergies and all kinds of stuff, the parents get them off dairy in one month it all clears up. So it, it's not that dairy is a horrible, wicked thing. It's that when we were healthy, maybe a few hundred years ago when we were healthier and we lived on farms and we hadn't totally destroyed our bodies with processed foods and pharmaceutical drugs and people worked in a field eight hours a day and they were sweating and they drank some raw milk, whoop de doo Today, we're addicted to food, we're using pharmaceutical drugs, three, four generations into doing all the wrong things, we don't exercise, and we're drinking milk. And we have cheese on everything. Right? So it, it's, just, it's just like, it's like glue to the body. It's, and th and that's, why, that's why everybody will feel better when they eliminate dairy. Now you're gonna fight it, like we did, like we went from the processed dairy and then we did the raw dairy and then we did less dairy and then like finally I'd be like, okay God, I give you the dairy. Like, you know, because we all love it, right? We love, we love cheese and ice cream and so the exception might be, you know, ice cream once in a while or whatever, but in general, like, you gotta ixnay the dairy. And especially if you're trying to heal of anything. If anybody's trying to heal of anything, you must eliminate dairy, period. It's just, it's just too heavy. So, any others? Yes. Yes, yes, because dairy would, t it's a good question, because uh, dairy is technically anything that comes from an animal. So almond milk, coconut milk, hemp milk, cashew milk, all that stuff would be much, much better for sure. For sure, yes. Yeah. Lemon to the water, great, absolutely. Nope. If you turn into a lemon, <laughs> you know, didn't didn't your parents didn't your parents tell you that? If you keep eating that, you're gonna turn into a watermelon, <laughs> or watermelon's gonna start growing out your ear. <laughs> no, I I think lemon and the I think lemon's one of the most powerful cleansers on the planet. Yeah. All right, class dismissed. What what's next week? Oh, what's after depression? I don't remember. It's up there. <laughs> <laughs>